Good evening, brothers and sisters. The scripture reading for this evening will be taken from the sixth chapter of Matthew. Beginning in verse 35, we read, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Why is it that you murmur amongst yourselves, saying, We cannot obey the word, because you have not all these things, and seek to excuse yourselves, saying that after all these things do the Gentiles seek? Behold, I say unto you that your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thank you so much for the ministry of music. Thank you so much to all of you for making my wife and I to feel so welcome in this place, to be numbered amongst friends and family, to be blessed at your hands. Good sister, I appreciate that ministry very much because I know that there are many times that each one of us has felt dead inside, has felt to wade in those shallows when the deep was offered before us. But the news is good because the light is great and the kingdom of God before us. I'd like to revisit those passages that were read in the Doctrine and Covenants that our brother brought before us in the call to worship. In section 6 in the Doctrine and Covenants, in verse 2a, Behold, the field is white already to harvest, Therefore, whoso desireth to reap, let him thrust in his sickle with his might and reap while the day lasts, that he may treasure up for his soul everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God. This is the message for tonight, that this kingdom of God is more important than we have known, that it deserves preeminence in our lives, that it should be the foremost of our thoughts, that it should be a cause for our rejoicing, that it should be a hope that we have this kingdom of God that shall never be spoiled, that shall never be tainted or taken, the light of this kingdom, Jesus Christ, which shall never fade or darken. If there was ever a people that had reason to have hope, it's this people. It is those who are faithful. It is those who have known their risen Savior. We also read in the same section in 5e, If thou wilt do good... And the invitation in the scriptures again and again is whosoever will, which means that all of us are invited into this great work, into this kingdom work. If thou wilt do good, yea, and hold out faithful to the end, if you will endure and hold out faithful to the end, thou shalt be saved in this kingdom of God, which is the greatest of all the gifts of God, for there is no gift greater than the gift of of salvation, that salvation, yes, in the kingdom of God. And in the close of this revelation, in 15c, we read, Fear not to do good, my sons, for whatsoever ye sow, that shall ye also reap. Therefore, if ye sow good, ye shall also reap good for your reward. Therefore, fear not, little flock, do good. Let earth and hell combine against you, for if you are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. Behold, I do not condemn you. Go your ways and sin no more. Perform with soberness the work which I have commanded you. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not and fear not. Behold the wounds which pierced my side and also the prints of the nails in my hands and feet. Be faithful, keep my commandments, and you shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. The message tonight is about that kingdom. It's a message of hope and deliverance. It's a message which had ought to remind us of the importance of that kingdom. It's a message that I hope 
every one of us can take and carry in our hearts, that as we go forth into this world, that we not only remember these things intellectually, but that we allow that light of Jesus Christ to shine so brightly in us that they see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We can bear record of him. In fact, we were made to this end. We were made in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ so that we don't have to remain in the shallows and to feel dead inside, but that we can thrive in that spirit. And that we can swim in those deep currents of his love in the kingdom of God. It's a work for every man, woman, and child. There's a passage found in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 33. That I'd like to read. This is a revelation that's given to Brother Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt had just been baptized by his brother Parley P. Pratt, and the two of them would ultimately serve in the quorum of 12 apostles between 1835 and 1839. And this is a message of that which was to come in these last days in verse 2a, and I'd like to draw from this passage, this prophetic language, so that we might revisit those works which are yet to unfold before us as they pertain to the kingdom of God. In section 33, 2a, we read, But before that great day shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall be turned into blood, and the stars shall refuse their shining, and some shall fall. And great destructions await the wicked. Wherefore, lift up your voice and spare not, for the Lord God hath spoken. And so we see that there was to be these signs in the heavens above, this prophetic language, which we read in other places, that the sun shall be darkened and the moon be turned into blood and the stars shall refuse their shining. We find it also in section 85, maybe more dramatically so. In verse 24b, of section 85, we read, For not many days hence, and the earth shall tremble, and reel to and fro as a drunken man, and the sun shall hide his face, and shall refuse to give light, and the moon shall be bathed in blood, and the stars shall become exceeding angry, and shall cast themselves down as a fig that falleth from off a fig tree. Now this very colorful and prophetic language has inspired a lot of interpretations and a lot of conjecture and equally colorful interpretations of what this might mean. But the scriptures give us clear context if we are to study those places in scriptural passage that similar language is used. And they instruct us that things will in fact change in these latter days, but that we shouldn't have fear about these things, that we shouldn't have darkness or oppression, but that we should actually have a great sense of hope and opportunity that the kingdom of God is before us because when we see these things come to pass, we will not bow our heads in sorrow, but we will lift our eyes heavenward and we will rejoice knowing that which is to come. I'd like to take just a moment, and thank you for your patience, to turn into the Old Testament so that we might revisit Other places where this same language is used. If we go to Isaiah chapter 13. What we'll find is that every time in the scriptures that this prophetic language is used, the darkening of the sun and the moon bathed in blood and the stars falling from the heavens that it is used in association with the fall of a kingdom and the rise of another kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 13, we read about the fall of a very great kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. And we know historically that this kingdom ultimately fell to the Medes and then to the Persians. And in chapter 13, we read similar language. In verse 10, it says, For the stars of heaven... And the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. 
I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man more than the gold wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of the host, and in that day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and as the sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. And every one that is proud shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined to the wicked shall file fall by the sword. And so we read here about the fall of Babylon, but it's important that we revisit this in the Old Testament because we see the association between this prophetic language about these changes in the heavens above, about those heavenly bodies that would ordinarily give light, not giving light, about those stars in the heavens being thrust down. We see that each time we read this in the scriptures, we're going to read that it's associated with the fall of a kingdom and in its place the rise of another kingdom here. We see a prophetic utterance about the fall of Babylon. And the fall of Babylon indeed was great because Babylon was a great nation and a great people. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens. If, if one was to be successful in this day and age, one would have to have a very good relationship with Babylon. The markets would flourish as a result of Babylon's industry. She was a powerful nation with great military might and great arrogance and pride. And this prophecy was uttered, and this great nation indeed fell at the hands of the Medes. If we turn to Ezekiel in chapter 32, moving forward in time, In Ezekiel chapter 32, in verse 7, we'll read similar language. And if you look at the preface to the chapter, many of your scriptures will provide an introduction. It will say the fall of Egypt. And in the first few verses, we see son of man take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And so here we see another great nation historically, the nation of Egypt, which was powerful which was mighty both in industry and market and military prowess. And here we read the same language that Egypt too would fall as great as she was. In verse 7 we read, And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. So again, it's the same prophetic language that we read that was given in section 33 to Orson Pratt. We read here again and again this association between this prophetic language and the fall of a great and mighty and arrogant and prideful nation. In this case, Egypt. And in time, Egypt too fell. We can move forward to Joel in the second chapter, a book from which the angel read and delivered those words to our brother Joseph. And in the book of Joel, we read the same prophetic language, but we read about a prophecy that is to unfold in the latter days, not something that happened anciently, not something that happened to Babylon, the nation, or Egypt, the nation, but something that was to unfold in the last days. In Joel chapter 2, in verse 10, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And in verse 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. If we go to Joel chapter 3, in verse 14, we read multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall, be, shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and 
the strength of the children of Israel. If we read in the book of Revelation about the fall of Babylon, not that ancient nation of Babylon, but that which is to come, we can read in Revelation chapter 18 that that fall will be great. And this time, it isn't just one nation in particular, but all those men who carry that spirit of haughtiness and pride of arrogance, who have lived deliciously, who have been prideful, who have invested their souls in the things of the world rather than the kingdom of God. And it says that all of those nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, that the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And we read in chapter 18 of Revelation about the fall of those in the last days who will be prideful. And then we come again to section 33. And that prophetic utterance and those same words given. But behold, that great day shall come, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall be turned into blood, the stars shall refuse their shining, and some shall fall. And great destructions await the wicked. Wherefore, lift up your voice and spare not, for the Lord God hath spoken it. And so we were warned in this revelation to Brother Orson Pratt, that there would be changes, in fact, in this world, that those things that seem indestructible to us today, that seem so mighty, would, in fact, fall in time, just like Babylon of old, who lived so deliciously and so pridefully and so arrogantly, who had such great strength in the arm of their flesh and such confidence in their markets, surely Babylon of old fell. And just as Egypt put their faith and their confidence and their trust in the strength of their flesh, and yet Egypt fell. And the same words are used here in section 33 to describe that which would become of this latter day of those who might be called Babylon because they have lived deliciously and trusted in the strength of their flesh. They too shall fall. Every time this prophetic language is used, it is used in association with the fall of a great nation or nations. It turns out that the kingdoms of men will rise and fall. But there is a kingdom in which we can labor and trust the fruit of that labor to eternity. If we have a willing heart, if we have faithful hands, if we are willing to endure to the end... There is a kingdom for us. There is a kingdom for every one of us. We are here today and we are gone tomorrow. But the kingdom of God is forever. No work in the kingdom of God is ever lost. No good work is ever done in vain. We might see things differently than God sees them. We might distinguish between great and small works. But I think it is much more important to our Heavenly Father to distinguish between right and wrong works. I believe that even the youngest one here is able to build up the kingdom of God, that we might labor in that kingdom even today. Are there any here who are younger than 13? If you're, if you're 12 years old or younger, please raise your hand. Wow. Wow. Kingdom builders. No, keep your hands up. If you're 12 years old or younger, keep your hands up. Now, if you have your hands up right now, tell me if there's any way. Leave your hands up if you believe that you can actually be a part of the building of the kingdom of God. We've read that these great nations of old have all fallen, and Babylon is gone, and Egypt is gone, and the day will come when all of these great kingdoms of men will also fall away, but we also know there's another kingdom, the kingdom of God. If you believe that you can be builders in that kingdom, leave your hands high. Raise them up high. Now, you're, all of you are 12 years old or younger, and yet you can build the kingdom of God. Do you believe that? Brother Bo, do you have a bedtime? Is there a time where your mother tells you to go to bed? 
There is, okay? Do you know that when you listen to her and you go to bed when she tells you to go to bed, you are taking part in the building of the kingdom of God? Did you know that? It's true, brother. Because the, the first commandment with promise, the first commandment with promise is to honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days might be long upon this earth. So, Brother Bo, when your mother tells you to go to bed and you go to bed, you're honoring thy mother and thy father, and in keeping the commandments, you're building the kingdom. But not the, not the kingdoms of men, but the very kingdom of God. So just remember that, Brother Bo. And just remember to teach everyone that you know that the kingdom of God is the most important thing in your life. And there were some in the back that raised their hands, the O'Neill family. Now, do you guys have homework? You do. Did you know that when you, when you do that homework, and you do that homework well, that you're participating in the building of the kingdom? Did you know that? That when your parents tell you that it's important for you to clean your rooms, do you clean your rooms? <laughs> kind of clean your rooms? Okay, well, when you're kind of cleaning your rooms, you're kind of building the kingdom. But if you should choose to clean your rooms all of the way, there's one good sister that does, you clean your room all the way. When you choose to clean your rooms all the way, you're choosing to build the kingdom of God. Because the first commandment with promise is to honor thy father and thy mother. And so as we keep the commandments, we build the kingdom of God. Now we're told in the scripture reading that I brought for this, the scripture reading this evening that we are called to seek to build the kingdom. It doesn't say that we're to wait for another to build the kingdom because you could wait for another person to build a kingdom. And Brother Bo, you could wait for another person to build a kingdom, but you don't have to wait for another person to build the kingdom. You can seek yourself to walk in those righteous paths, to do those things which you know are right, because, you know, the truth is all of us, all of us have a lot to learn. And you may feel like, I don't know all of the commandments. Guess what? None of us know all of the ways that we must walk in order to please God. All of us are doing the best that we can. All of us, in a sense, are children like you, just abiding within the laws that we understand to the best of our knowledge, being directed by that spirit and learning, ever learning and always learning to draw near unto our Father. This kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. It's very important to Jesus Christ. In fact, if we were to look through the scriptures to find out what was most important to Jesus Christ when he preached and he taught and he ministered upon the earth, we would find the kingdom of God was very, very important to Jesus Christ. If you have just a few moments, we might just look through a few scriptures. If we'll turn to Matthew in the fourth chapter. And, and, and we're going to read about the importance of the kingdom of God to Jesus Christ. But remember that when Jesus Christ lived, there was another great kingdom of man that was present, the Roman Empire. And where is the Roman Empire today? It's gone. It's gone. It's a whisper. It's, it's a historical note. There's a residue of it present but what I mean to suggest tonight is that we have to choose between the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God and to suggest that the kingdoms of men will rise and they will fall, they will rise and they will fall, that we cannot depend upon them. And if we invest ourselves in them, we will be heartbroken and sorrowful and sad. But there's an alternative, that if we invest ourselves truly and sincerely in the kingdom of God, that when we wake up in the morning, we think, what can I do today to build the kingdom? And when we lie down at night, we think, what more can I do tomorrow to build that kingdom? If we invest ourselves in the kingdom of God, we will not find sorrow and disappointment. We will find affliction and tribulation and trial, but we will find great joy in that kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 22, in Matthew 4, 22, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel 
of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among the people which believed on his name. If we were to go to Matthew 6, a few pages forward, we would read in Matthew 6, 38, Wherefore, seek not the things of the world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus Christ preached. It was the most important topic to him. If we go to Matthew 9, verse 41, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. If we go to Matthew 13, some of the great parables of the scriptures, and just a few pages forward, in Matthew 13, 22, Christ says, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto. If we go to verse 30, Another parable put he forth, saying unto him, The kingdom of heaven is like unto. And in verse 32, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven. In verse 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. In verse 47, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. And in verse 48, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. If we go to Luke chapter 4, Verse 43, in reference to Jesus Christ, Luke 4, 43, it says, But he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Jesus Christ was sent to preach the kingdom of God, and so he did. If we move forward a few pages to Luke 9, In verse 11, in Luke 9, 11, And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and he received them, and spake unto them of the kingdom of God. When Jesus Christ preached, when Jesus Christ taught, he preached and he taught the kingdom of God. It was foremost. It was preeminent. It was not a debate On the finer principles, it was the fullness of the gospel. We find that even after his death and his resurrection, Jesus Christ ministered in the kingdom of God. If we turn to the book of Acts, in the first chapter, Verse 3, beginning maybe in verse 2, in Acts 1, 2, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he cometh through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. So Jesus Christ, he taught them about the kingdom. He taught in every city about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. He gave parables about the kingdom. And then he died, and then he came back and he ministered with them for forty more days. And guess what? And speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. you might be able to recall what it was that the disciples then and the apostles went forth to teach the world. If we go forward to Acts 19, in verse 8, 
in reference to the ministry of Paul in 19.8, it says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. In Acts 20, the next chapter in verse 25. And now behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. And so in his parting, he reminds us of that which he was preaching. In Acts 28, in verse 23. Paul was appointed a day wherein he might speak unto the people. And it says in Acts 28, 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. And in verse 31 of the same chapter, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. You see, the kingdom of God was preeminent in the ministry of Jesus Christ. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote that he had been delivered from the powers of darkness and had been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. In Colossians 4.11, Paul commends his fellow laborers and the names of those that labor with Paul may not be as important in this context But he says, and Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers in the kingdom of God. It wasn't something that Brother Paul was waiting for. It was something Brother Paul was working in. Jesus was pressed in his ministry For the arrival of this kingdom, the Jews were anxious for something that they could see and touch and feel. They were anxious for a kingdom after the manner of men that would secure their freedom from the Romans. And so the Pharisees pressed Jesus about the arrival of this kingdom. After all of his preaching and teaching in all of these cities and in all of their synagogues and all of the disciples teaching and preaching the same, in Luke 17... In verse 20, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, in Luke 17, 20, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. If it's something you can see, it's not the kingdom, he says. It's not something I can point to. He says, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God has already come unto you. In Jesus' words, the kingdom had come. And the choice was then laid bare before these men, whether they would choose to labor in that kingdom or whether they would choose to be slothful. I believe we have the same choice today. I believe we have the same opportunity today. I believe the scriptures when they say that God has called us to build up that kingdom. I believe that we might choose that which is light, that we might rejoice in that which is good, The kingdom of God, after all, is a kingdom of light. 
And if we are the children of that kingdom, we must abide in that light. There is a great temptation, I believe, in these last days to give into darkness. But I do believe that there is a light that is left burning within each one of us. There is something within us that beckons us to fulfill the measure of our creation, which is to bear record of our Heavenly Father, to keep His commandments. We hear a lot about darkness in the world. Have, have you heard anything discouraging recently? Have you heard anything that was depressing recently? But you haven't heard that in these halls, right? And you haven't heard anything discouraging or depressing in the mouths of the saints, right? Because when we speak, we speak about the light, always the light and the kingdom, yes? But isn't that what we're called to do? Aren't we called to bear record of our Heavenly Father? Aren't we called to bear record of that kingdom? But how can we be children of the kingdom of God if from our mouths we bear record of darkness? The devil has his work and the devil has his angels. There is plenty of spirits in this world to remind us of the prevalence of evil. And there are plenty of those who are willing to bear record of darkness and to speak about those things that bring us into oppression and despair. But where are those who are willing to stand up and speak of the light and of the goodness and of the hope and of the building of the kingdom and the joy that we had ought to have in that kingdom? Are these dark days or are these light days? Well, a lot of it depends on which kingdom you've given yourself to. Because we will see what we desire to see and we will live in the kingdom of our choosing. Doctrine and Covenants in section 50. This is an amazing passage in Doctrine and Covenants section 50 in paragraph 6. Because to answer my question for myself, I hear a lot about the darkness. I hear a lot about those things which are discouraging and those things which are depressing, right? And I hear about that all the time, and I don't just hear about it in the worldly media, but I hear about it from my friends in the church and my brothers and sisters. But there's this promise in section 50 that I can't shake out of my heart. There's this light that burns inside of me that wants to resist that darkness, that wants to take that light into every corner of the world and say, yes, there's darkness if you want it. There always has been darkness if you wanted it. But there is also an overwhelming abundance of light and goodness and hope and joy in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the kingdom of God. And what is it that we will share? What is it that we'll share with one another? What is it that we'll share in the workplace, at school? What is it that we will dwell upon? Because we will bear record of something. The question is, what are we bearing record of? We just read that Jesus Christ bore record all of the time about the kingdom of God. But that was probably because there was no political corruption in his day, right? There was no politics to speak of. But then wait a minute, what about the Romans... And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the corruption there and the tax collectors. Wasn't there quite a lot of political corruption? But we don't read Jesus Christ talking about that. When he bore record, guess what he bore record of? He bore record of the kingdom of God. He bore record of light. That's what I feel in my heart. That's what I feel burning inside of me. And so I'm sorry if I can't feel the darkness that I'm supposed to feel or the depression, or the despair of these dark days because my mind is so fixed upon that which is light and good and holy and true in Jesus Christ, and his light has not faded. And the darkness that is in the world only gives contrast to that which is bright and shining and light. Is this super boring? If this is the most boring sermon you've ever heard, raise your hand. Okay. Just one. Good. <laughs> let's, let's look in section 50. Let's look in section 50 in 6b. It says, and that which doth not edify is not of God and is darkness. And so that tells me that's something I don't want any part of. 
I don't want it in my mouth. I don't want it in my heart. I don't want it in my home. That which doth not edify is not of God is darkness. That which is of God is light. That's sounding better. That which is of God is light. And he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light. And just when you receive that light, guess what? There's even better news, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. So there are some men telling me that things are becoming darker and darker and darker, but then there's the Spirit of God within me that says things are brighter and brighter and brighter. The more that you give yourself to me and surrender yourself to me, I will show you a kingdom in which the light shines without dimming. That's the promise that we receive in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the gospel of the kingdom, that it says, in the last days shall go forth into all the world. The world needs the message, yes, but the world needs the messenger who is Jesus Christ. And the world will see that messenger in your light, in your testimony, in your bearing record. Bo, you'll build up the kingdom of God. He was almost asleep. It's not bedtime yet. Bo, you will build up the kingdom of God whenever you do that which is good. You don't have to wait. And, and those of you who are diligently doing your homework, when you do that which your parents tell you to do, guess what? You're building the kingdom of God. And you know what? Encourage your parents as well by being a good example and responding and being obedient. It's interesting that uh, God overcame the Midianites. And if you remember how God overcame the Midianites, now it's, it's different than how men do war because when men do war, we do war with swords or, or shields or missiles or, or guns or something like that. We do something um, that is familiar in a military sense. But if you remember how God overcame the Midianites, it was very peculiar. God overcame the Midianites through a man named Gideon and how he did it is he did it with lights in, in earthen vessels. And when those lights shone out of those earthen vessels, then those that were of dark forces scattered and they fell upon one another's necks. And actually the evil killed the evil. But that wasn't something that will only happen in days gone by. That's a promise to us today. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter about these earthen vessels with lights inside. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Remember how Gideon carried those lights in earthen vessels down, and as a result of that effort, those dark forces were put away and destroyed. So Paul calls us in his letter to the church at Corinth, you too are earthen vessels, but the light that is in you is not a candle, it's not a lamp, it's the very light of Jesus Christ. And by that means, he will not only overthrow the Midianites, but all those who oppose him in his kingdom. You are those earthen vessels, you have that light within you. He says, we are troubled on every side, but we are not distressed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are cast down, but we are not destroyed. In these final hours, we will find that which we look for. Let us look for the light. Let us give as we have been given. If we are not preaching the good news, we are not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, at least not the gospel of the kingdom that he preached. Paul encouraged the church at Philippi to look upon that which is light. If we look in Philippians, in the fourth chapter, in Philippians 4 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, 
If there be any praise, think on these things. Is that what we are thinking upon? Just ask yourselves now in your hearts and be honest day to day to day in your work, at home, at school. Is that what is upon your mind? Things that are honest, good, pure, just, lovely. Wherever there be virtue or good, wherever there be praise, think on these things. He writes this to a church at Philippi, which was positioned in in a very terrible place because of the corruption of the Greeks and the Romans. The scriptures admonish us to keep our eyes single to the glory of God. They admonish us to bear record of him, to stand as witnesses of Christ in word and in deed. We cannot be the children of God. We cannot be the children of the kingdom if we bear record of the world. There are enough witnesses of that which is dark. We must be witnesses of that which is light. And where we find sin, we must purge it. We must give access to our Heavenly Father, to every chamber of our heart, until those places of fear and jealousy, of anger and hurt, are places of light and hope and goodness. In the kingdoms of the world, men boast and puff themselves up, But in the kingdom of God, we discover that we are very small. But not because we are of little value, but because we stand in the very real presence of one who is truly great. In God's presence, the greatest of men are humbled. It was in God's presence that David exclaimed, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And Moses, who the scriptures say was the meekest man upon the earth, coming into the presence of God, he said, Now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never before supposed. The way to find joy in the Holy Ghost is not to believe in ourselves, to trust in our own kingdoms and build our own empires, not to rely upon our strength and our markets and our militaries. but to acknowledge that God has loved us in our nothingness. Not because we are great, but because he is truly great. We have stumbled and fallen, but he has not forsaken us. And as we began to appreciate even more that gap in holiness between God and man, we can more deeply appreciate that great divide which he has crossed to reclaim us. We don't have hope because we are perfect. We have hope because he is. And because he is lovingly dispositioned toward us. I'd like to close with a passage from the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. To remind us of the work of our Savior, that we might remember the light that he is and that now shines in us, that we might develop in us a heart to love others as we have been loved, that we might be advocates unto others as Christ has advocated for us, that we might take joy in that which is before us and rejoice and the opportunity to be lights in a world that is dark. God has allowed us to be here, and it is a great and marvelous privilege to stand in this dispensation and to bear record of our Heavenly Father. In 45.1c, it says, Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father. 
who is pleading your cause before him, saying. Now, this was given in 1831, so this isn't something that is historic. It isn't saying that Christ was once crucified for you, he did this one work, but now he's forgotten about you. It says, no, in 1831, he's here today, and guess what? He's still there today. Who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and the death of him who died, who did no sin. Behold the sufferings of the, and the death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, he says, Wherefore, Father, Spare these, my brethren, that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. Now, if nothing has ever broken your heart, let your heart be broken with these words, that one who did no sin died for us and that he has not removed himself from us but that he continues to plead before our heavenly father in the kingdom of God and he says unto his father spare these my brethren to think that Jesus Christ would call me his brother When I have warred against him, when I have broken his laws, when I have chosen that which is displeasing, he has come for us when we were yet enemies to him. And we can love others when we understand how he loves us. That he calls us his brethren. Those 12 year olds who are present and younger who are still awake after bedtime even now, if you'll raise your hands again. I want those who are 12 and younger to remember this. Are you listening? The kingdom of God is very, very, very important. And the king of that kingdom, even Jesus Christ, has called you his brother. And he would call you his sister. And with a brother as a king, let us build that kingdom.